Okay, hi everyone. So we finished our bacteria lectures. Now we're going to move on to fungi this week and then viruses next week. And as with the other lectures, please email your questions if you have them or put them on the Padlet. And if you're struggling with any of the topics, let me know and I can help you with these. There will be another exam preparation session in December. So if you let me know any topics you want me to go over then. We will be focusing on fungi and viruses and vaccines. But if you've got any bacteria topics you want me to cover, I can do that. But please let me know the topics you want me to cover in advance. OK, so before the session, so then I can factor it in the time for the session and also get the slides ready for you. OK, otherwise I can't guarantee we'll be able to get to the topic. So why is it important for pharmacists to know about fungi? Well, first of all, fungal diseases are very common and several of the diseases such as thrush and athlete's foot can be treated with over-the-counter products in the pharmacy. In addition, several important drugs have also been produced from fungi, such as penicillin. It's therefore very important for pharmacists to know about different types of fungi, especially the pathogens, and to understand the different structures and the way that they reproduce. Later in the course, you learn more detail about fungal diseases and the, the treatments of these conditions. So in this lecture, we will describe mycology and its significance, and we'll look at how fungi is different from other microbes, such as bacteria. You will also learn about the structure of fungi and the differences between the bacterial and fungal cell wall. You will also learn about the different methods of fungal reproduction, and we will look at some pathogenic fungi and look at the symptoms that they cause. OK, so before we start looking at fungi in more detail, we need to look at some commonly used terms. So mycology is the study of fungi. Myco means fungus and it comes from the Greek. Mycologists, therefore, are the scientists that study fungi. And mycotoxicology is specifically the study of fungal toxins. Then mucoses are the diseases caused by fungi. The study of fungi is very important for human life as we gain many beneficial products from fungi, for example, medicines, food, biopesticides. But then we also have the negative side of fungi. So we have the pathogenic fungi, which cause fungal diseases in humans. Although many fungal diseases are mild and easy to treat, there are several that are extremely serious and can't, can actually cause death. So medical myco mycology is the branch of mycology that studies the pathogenic fungi that cause disease in humans and other animals, as well as their treatments. So medical mycology is an extremely important area of study because there are more than 1.5 million deaths worldwide each year caused by fun fungal infections. And there is a very urgent need for new fungal antifungal treatments. So currently there are only three major groups of antifungal drugs and each group has significant disadvantages. For example, interactions with other drugs or limited formulations. And another big issue is that fungi has started to become resistant to current antifungal treatments. So this is why there is a really, really urgent need to research and get more antifungal treatments. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms. And if you remember, the eukaryotes are the organisms whose cells have a nucleus enclosed within a nuclear envelope. And there are four types of eukaryotes. So we've got animals, plants, fungi and protists. So you have the macroscopic fungi, which are visible to the naked eye, for example, mushrooms and moulds. But then you also have the microscopic fungi, such as unicellular yeasts, and also the spores of macroscopic fungi are microscopic as well. So fungi were originally thought to be primitive plants, but they actually lack chlorophyll, which is essential for photosynthesis in plants in order to produce nutrients. So they're now thought to be unique organisms, different from both animals and plants. So as we said, uh, fungi are thought to be different from both plants and animals, as they're different in how they gain nutrition and how they grow and reproduce. And we said previously that fungi can be beneficial, 
but some can also cause illness. So they were the mycoses, the fungal diseases. Some fungi are what we would call opportunistic fungi, which means that they wouldn't usually cause infections in healthy people, but they can cause infection under certain circumstances. For example, when the person's immune system is compromised. So this can occur in cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy actually reduces the white blood cell count. So that's the number of white blood cells, the immune cells in the blood. And because they've reduced those, the opportunistic fungi then can take hold. OK, because the immune system is not strong enough to fight them off. Opportunistic fungal pneumonia is a particularly serious example. And this has a particularly high death rate. So fungi are found throughout the world from polar to tropical regions. They're mainly terrestrial, which means they mainly live on land, but some do live in freshwater and marine environments. In addition, certain fungi can actually associate with other organisms, such as algae or cyanobacteria, in a symbiotic relationship. And this combination of the fungus and its partner is called a lichen. So what do we mean by a symbiotic relationship? So a symbiotic relationship is a close relationship between two species in which at least one of the species benefits. So the symbiosis can be mutualistic and that means both species benefit or commensalistic and that's where one species benefits whilst the other is not affected. Or the symbiosis can be parasitic, where one species benefits while the other one is harmed. So at first glance, the, in the case of the lichen, lichen, the relationship seems to be mutualistic at first glance, as the partner supplies food and then the fungus provides the partner with a protective environment. However, most scientists actually consider the relationship to be a controlled parasitism because the photosynthetic, the photosynthetic partner grows less well than it would without the fungus. So lichens are widespread and present in harsh environments such as deserts and tundra. They're slow growing and can live for centuries. They've been used in foods and to extract, extract chemicals such as dyes or antimicrobial substances. They've also been used as environmental indicators as some are very sensitive to pollution. So this slide shows different types of lichen. There are three main types of lichen. First of all, the fr fruticose lichen. And this is the yellow green lichen here. The fruticose lichens have rounded structures and a branched appearance and they're actually poisonous. And these are actually used to make poisoned arrowheads by Native American tribes. And they're also used in Europe to poison wolves. Then you have the folios lichen, which are the, that's the green picture, green lichen, which have leaf-like lobes. And the third type is the crustos lichen. And they're tightly attached to the substrate, giving them like a crusty appearance. So you can see that orange crust on the rock at the bottom right hand corner. Okay, so like animals, fungi are heterotrophs, which mean they can't synthesize their own food. So they rely on complex organic compounds as a source of carbon, which they then obtain from their diet. However, unlike animals, which ingest, they take in their food and swallow it and then digest their food. Fungi actually does this in reverse order. So fungi digest their food outside the body by secreting hydrolytic enzymes into the food and then they absorb the smaller molecules. Fungi are mostly saprophytes and what this means is they derive their nutrients from decaying organic matter, mainly plant material. They are very important biodegraders uh, they can release enzymes which can break down cellulose and lignin of dead wood and they can break these down into readily absorbable glucose molecules. Due to their various metabolic pathways there is a lot of research going on into using fungi as tools in bioremediation and this is a process which involves the use of microbes such as fungi 
in the remove in the removal of contaminants, pollutants and toxins from soil, water and other environments. OK, so there's a lot of research going on in that area. So in terms of the structure of fungi, the single celled fungi are referred to as yeasts, while multicellular masses are called moulds. Fungi also include macroscopic puffballs and mushrooms, which are visible to the naked eye. And the fungal body is called the thallus. And the thallus of a mould consists of long branch thread like filaments called hyphae that form a tangled mass called a mycelium. So this slide shows the diagram of a mushroom. And you can see that the reproductive structure is above ground and that there are numerous hyphae that extend, extend below ground where they form the mycelium. And we'll, we will look more at mushroom structure and function later on. So this slide shows the structure of the cell wall of fungi and compares it to bacteria. So similar to bacteria, the fungi cells are surrounded by a cell membrane and a cell wall. But unlike bacteria, the cell wall, the fungal cell wall does not contain peptide or glycan. Instead, it contains something called chitin, which is a nitrogen containing polysaccharide. And it also contains glucans, and these are glucose polymers that cross-link chitin. And also different to bacteria, fung fungi cell walls have mannose-bound proteins which form the outla outer layer. But similarly to bacteria, the fungal cell wall acts as a structural barrier and protects the cell from osmotic lysis.